sometimes that's all that the beginner is running off of is that fire, right? Mm. And then in the process of learning more of the craft, that gets that gets sort of relegated into the corner. And it's still meant to be front and center, right? All the stuff that you're learning is meant to be in service to that thing. But what happens is 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 that yeah, everything becomes about about the 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 technique. It becomes about the tool you're using to to do the job, right? Which is like, look, the house isn't about the hammer. This is Way of the Artist with Brandon Colby Cook and Evan Schulte, exploring the challenges of the creative call so that you can claim your own path and make your life a work of art. All right. All right, all right, all right. <laughs> Here we go, people. We're we're here again. If you're not sick of us talking about some more stuff that has to do with artistry and life and bringing artistry to life and all of that wonderful stuff, and we're calling this one today maturing into mastery. And Brandon is the sort of brainchild to this uh, this this topic today, but was something that piqued my interest and curiosity. And I think we might have, a, a, you know, as you would probably hope with a couple of different people, you hope different people bring different perspectives into the thing. I have some, some in, well, some ideas that interest me about that, whether you find that interesting or not is a whole other thing. But what interests me about this idea that we're going into and to me, but what this means is in this pursuit of mastery, there is a kind of maturity that, that is involved with that. And, and mastery doesn't necessarily mean that you are perfect, but there's, there's a familiarity and the word that came up that we were talking, uh, that we were using was also intimacy, intimacy with what you're doing. And as an artist or an artisan or a person who, when you spend when you spend a lot of time and care and attention into something which i think is part of the wisdom of that idea of like stick with something right like that's i don't think that's an always situation because there are moments where you have to just you have to just let something go but the wisdom behind really sticking with something i think is because of that intimacy and that intimacy brings you into the mastery of something. And that that knowledge, that deep, deep knowledge that really spending time with doing something and learning how to do something, for me and, and what I'm interested in, in going into with this conversation today is how that thing starts to teach us. You know, like there's... It, it, there's we're not just learning how to do it, but it's also teaching us things that I think go far beyond just maybe the technical thing that we're learning to do. And that's an angle on this that I'm interested in exploring. So that's, that's where I will leave it as far as setting, setting forth. Brandon, how about for yourself? Something that I've kind of just, I don't know, realized i guess over the last little bit is how there's well i don't know i guess putting your focus on something for a while you begin to evolve how you might look at it and relate to it so i think for me this is a lot about growing up with an art or growing up with a passion and it grows up with you and your initial relating to it. it, It's, it's not unlike dating in a way and then evolving into kind of a marriage 
and then having children. You know, I, I imagine it has a similar relationship to it because it's like, it starts out, you're like really attracted, you know, it's like really want it. Like I remember like wanting acting and just like wanting to be a part of it, wanting to be an actor, like how exciting it was and how like all I wanted to do was act. And I just like, just being in class was amazing, you know? And it's like dating, you know, you meet somebody, you fall for them and you just want to be around them every second, you know? And then after a while, you know, um, it becomes about, okay, like we're doing this, you know, like I'm in this, we're doing this and you're, you're figuring out, okay, like how do we do this day to day? You know, <laughs> like I got bills to pay. I got life to take care of. I got all this stuff. I got to make sure, you know, um, I'm auditioning and whatever. And, and then it becomes more practical. And I feel like relationships, they evolve into the practical. And then, you know, and then maybe you get to the point where you actually start creating stuff. You know, you start booking roles and you start creating movies and shows and things like that. And those are your children. Those are the things that, you know, are a product of this relationship you've started. And then you start to realize about what it takes to actually do that and what that means. And the, the effect that those things have is an extension of you because people see your work and they relate to it or they see, you know, they see you doing it. And, and then um, those, maybe those things, maybe they mature, maybe they grow up, maybe whatever, but like you do too. And um, the reasons why maybe like I started with, say acting and filmmaking and stuff they they've just matured they've evolved and so have i and it's it's now um it's kind of an exciting time really because at this point for me i mean i i can really do anything i want i mean I don't, i'm not trying to brag i'm just saying like that that's just where i've gone to like i could write a script i could put up a play i could make a movie i could get back into auditioning, start acting, you know, if I wanted to do that, or, you know, really there's just endless options. I could, I know how to put together a team to make, to, to do this stuff. So now it just becomes about, okay, like it's not so mysterious anymore. It's like, what do you want to do? And, and why do you want to do it? And, and, and then like, not just doing it because I love it, but because I know what it can do. And to me, there's something very interesting about how mastery, I think in the early stages, it seems like this, like, oh, like I can't wait to be masterful. I hope one day I can be, maybe I can get there. But mastery in, in actually reality and practicality is more like, what do I even do with this now? Not like, I wonder if I can, but it's like, why would I do it? You know what I mean? Like in, in a good way, because now it becomes about like, if I could emotionally impact somebody with something I write, how do I want to emotionally impact them? And why do I want to do it? Like, cause I feel like mastery is when you actually become capable of actually doing the things with the stuff that you, that seems so almost mysterious in the beginning. And I think that's where I think that's where this conversation inter interests me. It's where when the mystery goes away, the the mystery of the date, you know, the mystery of the new thing, when it becomes almost normal, it becomes like it's your part of your blood, like it's just a part of you. Then it becomes, well, like, what do I actually now that I have the capacity and capability of doing this? What am I actually trying to do? You know, because at first it was just like it almost felt like. I don't know if you had this experience, Evan, but I remember early on, some things almost felt like, I I just hope one day I can get there. And I'm I, like, I don't know what get there means exactly, but like, whatever that was has kind of gone away. And now there's this like, now that I'm kind of here, it's like, well, what, what do you want to do with that? You know, like, you know. There's always learning, but I mean, there's a point where you just like, yeah, like you can, you can just do anything you want. Like you can, you can really just do it because you understand how it works now. And I think that, that to me is the maturity of it, you know, and the mastery is just simply, I mean, there's the master's master, I suppose, you know, where it's like, you become so good at something that, you know, you, 
you found your voice, like mastery of your voice, which I think is a bit different than say, and maybe that's another level, you know, for me personally to travel to and, and adventure towards, but like the mastery of the craft, for example, like just knowing how to make a film, knowing all the elements, knowing the departments, knowing how to get a script done, knowing all this stuff, that's not mysterious to me anymore. You know, that's, um, it's a very, it's a very simple kind of straightforward thing that I understand how to do. And then, you know, now that I, now that I can do it, it's like, what, what I want to do with it. And I think those questions are interesting questions because they're, they're deeper questions. They're more intimate questions. They're more about the artist voice. And I feel like that's what mastery ultimately gets you to. It gets you to the point where you you're not clouded anymore by any technique, like technique and all of that stuff is all just kind of secondary to like, what's my voice? What's my expression? Like, like why am I called to whatever art medium I'm called to, you know? Cause it, like, I imagine if you're a painter and you've learned all the painting styles and you've learned how to do everything with the brush and how to, how to manipulate the paint to make any color you want or any shade you want, well, now that you know all that, what do you want to do with it? And that's a much more important question. But early on, you're so just distracted by technique and trying to figure out how to actually do this stuff that you don't spend a lot of time, I think, initially. Well, at least uh, like I feel like for me and I feel like for most people, we're not we're not encouraged to entertain our voice because we don't even know what it is, first of all. And secondly, it's just about like that doesn't sell. What sells is teaching people how to like do a technique. That's what sells books mostly, right? Because people want to learn how to, right? But once you get past the how to, what do you want to do? <laughs> that's what I'm kind of interested in this conversation. I don't know. It's a roundabout way of saying it maybe, but yeah, that's, that's where I'm at with it. No, I, I think that, no, I think that you, you bring in a lot of interesting ideas in, into this conversation with, with some of what you said. One of them for me is, you know, I, I think about there's this concept of beginner's mind, which mm -hmm. I think comes, I think that, you know, that's an idea that, that predominantly comes out of, out of the East, but beginner's mind, as I understand it is a very particular thing. And beginner's mind is this kind of actually something that you want to keep, you know, it's something that you never want to lose beginner's mind because beginner's mind is what keeps your mind fresh it's what keeps it alert and i think that what's interesting is part of becoming a master is, is you and and maturing into that is you become familiar but you never lose that that part because you understand that, that part is essential to you being able to do the things still and just to put but this is something that that recently I experienced and saw there was uh, I went to a birthday party last week and uh, you know, I was out kind of in the woods and stuff like that. And they set up, uh, they set up an ax throwing station. So there was these big cedar rounds that they had set up and, and a bunch of different, different axes. And there was, there was this uh girl there who was like oh yeah i want to give it a shot and she stepped in and she like threw three axes boom 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 all stuck right in she never she never done it before in in her life and she's like oh wow and we we're like we we're all like whoa like amazing like nobody nobody who had stepped up who had never done it before like had had managed to achieve that and so she went to do three more and three were just like ping, ping, ping. They, none of them stuck. And the whole thing was she started thinking about it, you know, a lot more and where, and, and there's this, it's like this beginner's mind is, and, and why I think in the, in the West, we would probably more so talk about as beginner's luck, right? It's beginner's luck. And there's this thing that can happen where it's like you, you just sort of do it with whatever instinct that you have. And then after you've done it, it kind of just disappears because you're, you're suddenly thinking about it. You're like, okay, I got all those things. And there's all these things that can start to, to play on you. And 
I think that, that, yeah, that, that part of that, that maturity and mastery is never losing that while at the same time, you know, one of the metaphors that I'd used with you earlier was, you know, it's like when you become intimate with the thing that you're doing, it's like, it's like you just, you, you know, the, the lay of this land, you know, there's this territory that you've explored, you've explored all of its corners and its cracks and its dark places and its high places, its low places. You've, you have, you have really spent a lot of time in this area. And so you really know it. And that knowing is not just an intellectual knowing. It's, it's a feeling, it's an instinct, it's an intuition. These things start to, to take over. But with that territory that you know, you also know that with it, it's going to show you, it's going to constantly show you new things. Right? But because you know that territory, you know how to navigate those new things. Or, you know, or, or at least you, you know how to, you know, if, if suddenly a bear appears in this one area of this territory, it's like, you know, your, your high ground, you know, where, where to be, you know, how to, how to stay safe, or, you know, how to, you know, there's, there's these things that you, that begin to take shape and take hold within yourself in what you are, what you're able to do, if that makes sense. I hope that that made sense. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I, well, there's like a comfort, I think with the handling of whatever tool or thing that you're using, you know, it's like, um, I don't, I don't know. It could be anything. I mean, it's just like they get first when she threw the axes, she's not, if she's not thinking about how she's holding the ax, how she's moving her arm and all that stuff that, you know, you could probably refine. There is a relaxation element that's just there. Right. And you just, you just let that exist. And then once you start trying to get it right, that's when you weirdly start to see how you're getting it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and then it just becomes this, you know, like, and I think that's where, you know, mastery kind of takes over because that beginner's mind, when you were relaxed and you didn't know any better and had what I also want to add in, probably no expectation of yourself, mm. then mastery yeah. comes in and mastery erases expectation because you don't worry about whether you know it or not. You just know it, you know, you know, you know what you need to do and it doesn't become a concern of yours anymore. You know, you're just like, Oh yeah. Like you got to feel for it. It's, it's a, uh, you know, um, you, you get a sense that you just kind of, you just kind of know like this knowingness. And mm -hmm. when the knowingness is there, that's when I think you, you allow yourself to be relaxed enough to, you know, to express and to ex explore. And that's where it becomes quite masterful because, you know, there's nothing worse than seeing the work, right? It's weird in yeah. art because in, in art is the one thing where we want it to almost feel like there was no work at all. Mm -hmm. And yet there's so much work involved to get to the no work point. And that's what I, that's what I feel like the maturity is the point where your seeming, seemingly effortless attempt was filled with a wealth of experience and hardship to go. And so maturing, like, it's so easy for someone to speak on something that they have an experience and say, oh, you know, it, it, so idealistic. You know, I think that's why young people tend to be very idealistic because they're like, oh, you just do this and you just do that. It's like, okay, great. Yeah. But like when you're there, then let's see how you actually show up. Like I used to play soccer and I remember uh, we'd have days where it was pouring rain and it was snowing and it was cold and the, your thighs I just remember the, the, the pain on my skin when it was like cold and then to trap a ball with your thigh, when it comes in, like after someone's kicked it all the way down the field, 
and then you're supposed to take it down with your leg and just knowing how that's going to feel in the cold, wet, harsh wind when you got, you know, your skin has already like got goosebumps on it and you're just, you know, and what happens is after you've played for a while, you get this almost numbness in your thighs. I don't know how to describe it other than that, where it just becomes a non-issue where you just decide uh, somehow that it just doesn't matter. And there's pain that you can tolerate that say someone new to it, they just, it would, it would just knock them. Like they just, you know, and I remember those early days before I had to develop the tolerance to be able to handle that and how hard it was. And even just like um, in soccer, like hitting your, hitting the ball with your head on a cold, icy day, <laughs> it's such a frightening concept like people don't think about this but like you know because it looks so seamless but like you just develop an ability to kn you know what it pain to expect you know what it's going to feel like you just you just it becomes a non-issue anymore and it's not i don't know if the pain necessarily disappears it just doesn't matter like it did before it's not a frightening almost foreign thing anymore and i think with um you know, with mastery and acting, I might relate to that, like going to a place of anger can be frightening for an actor. And the first times you do it and you're out of control in your anger, it it's like you don't even know what to do and you almost like want to get away from it. Maybe even sadness, things like that can can be similar. But there comes a point, I think, in mastery where you get there and you're like, this is OK. It's like you can tolerate it and you can tolerate being out of control a little bit. Because by being able to tolerate it, you're in a way in control. And I feel like that's where the maturity and the mastery kind of comes in. It's like you are in control of what you're out of control of. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like you, you have an awareness of what, what control you have to let go of and you become at peace with it. And that's kind of the mastery. Whereas the new person doesn't know where they're out of control yet. They haven't found the boundaries. And so they they can kind of like lose it or go off the rails and they can get mm. freaked out by it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And that's something that I shared, I think on, on, on the podcast a little while ago was something from Alan Watts where he had said something about the master and the master artist is essentially bringing, bringing the elements that they, that they do not control into a context, which they do. Mm -hmm. Right. As opposed to just being, yeah, like a, a technician. And I think that that's, there is that, that step and, and it's part of the journey, I think, because there are these things to be learned and, and to become proficient in, but the mistake, which is something that the great acting teacher Sanford Meisner said so the, is that he's like it's not about the technique and that's where I think a lot of artists and, and not just in the arts but where where people get hung up where and I think that that might actually be the biggest the biggest barrier to that place that we might call mastery it's not it's not being a beginner it's not being a beginner. I think that the biggest barrier is that place that where you've now that you now you started to learn some stuff, right? To me, that's the biggest trap because now you think that the stuff you learned is the thing, and you know as as you were saying and and alluding to earlier, it's like that's that's not the thing. Like it's it, there's a a place where you have to go beyond that, and it becomes it becomes a thing that's just in service to you even if it's not even if it's something that you don't even deploy right because that can very much be a part of any art form you know like it's not just about and this was something that i did earlier as an actor which was okay i'm just going to deploy all of these techniques and tools and throw it at this thing blindly right and i think that that's where there's there's this mistake and in a way it makes sense. And in a way, I suppose that's, there's a thoroughness to that, but I think that there's also can be a, a huge waste of energy that, 
that happens that way as well because you are you're you're pulling things out of your tool bag that you don't even need to to be using right and and so now you're carrying around all this weight you're using all this stuff that has no place for this context and this moment and and that's where all of the focus is going and what gets lost in the process is is the thing that drove you to doing the thing in the first place right like one of the things that i like to remind actors of i love to remind actors of whenever they're taking on a new part whether they're just going in for an audition on it or they have this part and they're they're getting into it more deeply some of the first things to ask yourself before you start all the the tools and techniques and and breaking breaking everything down is have you asked yourself what do you love about this part what do you love about this story what fire do you have about this part what do what what's the fire in you about this role what what must you say about this person Right. What must you say about this person? What would what would make you feel what would make you feel really weary and anxious if you didn't say this about this person? You know, like these these kinds of questions are so important because at least for myself and and you know, a lot of students have found them have said to say that they're they're beneficial as well, but they they're they help you tap into the thing that's that it's really all that it's really all about right so before you start becoming really heady and intellectual about this process let's make sure we're we're we know where we're coming from you know where we know where we actually have our greatest where our greatest strength and passion for this thing that we're about to undertake where it originates from Right. And I think that that's a thing that gets lost so often because the beginner often comes in with, I think sometimes with sometimes actually an intimate knowledge of that fire. And, and sometimes that's all that the beginner is running off of is that fire. Right. Mm -hmm. And then in the process of learning more of the craft that gets that gets sort of relegated into the corner and it's still meant to be front and center right all the stuff that you're learning is meant to be in service to that thing but what happens is 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 that yeah everything becomes about about the 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 technique it becomes about the tool you're using to to do the job Right. Which is like, look, the house isn't about the hammer. Yeah. Right. Like, (laughs) right. The house is the house. The house is, is, is about the, the beautiful thing that lives live in and have experiences in and all of this stuff. It's not about the fucking hammer. Right. But we, but we oftentimes we get hung up and, and we get almost, I don't know what it is. I, I, we become so, uh, I can't think of the word that is. It's like almost like we we become bewitched, or or there's something that that causes us to to just become so mesmerized. Maybe that's the best word that I've got for it at the moment. So mesmerized by the power of these tools sometimes, because sometimes the tools are very powerful when they're when they're properly deployed. And so we can become like, oh, wow, look at what that thing can do. And so we become so obsessed with it, not realizing that it's like, yeah, no, it, it is powerful, but not for the reason that you're thinking, right? It's not, not for the reasons that, that are going, don't, be, don't get too, too caught up and mesmerized and hypnotized by this, this thing that's just happened, right? Mm. Like it's, it's still not the, the thing. Yeah, that's, well, that's a great analogy because, you know, I think that's, that's one of the challenges where when you're learning something, you get mesmerized by the tool 
that does the job as opposed to the job itself. And, um, you know, I think the master appreciates the tool for how the tool helps them do something, but they're totally willing to use a different tool if that's all they got. And that's where mm-hmm. the master becomes very flexible. And I, I think about this like in carpentry or, um, you know, that type of thing. And it's like, you know, if you're, if you're trying to build something, you know, or you're trying to take something apart, there are certain tools that are helpful, but sometimes you don't have those tools. So you still got to take it apart. And sometimes what's interesting is watching someone take something apart without the best tool. That's actually what makes it interesting. Mm. I mean, I, I think about this a lot from a screenwriter. One of the things that I learned probably a little bit late in the game, but I still appreciate that I learned it, it was ultimately that creating a character that can easily get a job done doesn't serve you very well often as a screenwriter. It's actually you want <laughs> the character that can't get the job done because you can make a meal out of a molehill essentially in screenwriting if you can get the right character in the wrong circumstance or the wrong mm-hmm. character in the right circumstance you know everyone will look at it and um it it becomes more fun to go like okay we don't have the right tool for the job how are we going to take this apart and that's what the audience actually wants to see that, mm. that's actually what's interesting right um and then uh you know i've talked about this on the podcast before but like if I was to share anything with a, with a, a writer, I would say, why don't you just paint yourself into a corner? I don't know how to get out of this. Then start to learn screenwriting. <laughs> it's like, that's when you're, that's when learning screenwriting, you're going to realize why learning these techniques and tools is actually valuable. Cause half the time I find, you know, like people can talk all day about like, Oh, this is how you do this. And this is how you do that. I'm like, you do it, but they can't do it because the tool doesn't matter until you're in the circumstance a lot of the time. You know, there's all these great techniques that people talk about in screenwriting, and I'm sure we can we can use any art medium. I'll just use this one because it's one that I'm familiar with. But there's so many techniques you can use. There's like so many. I like I I couldn't even list them off. But like it would probably take me this whole podcast just to like run through them all and how they all work. But like often you just need one, and you need it at the right time in the right place. And Um, you know, I, I've shared this on a podcast before, like one of my go-to tools is secret and, and, you know, and I find a lot of writers, we, we end up having a few tools that are like our go-tos. And then it's like, Hey, I've used this tool too much. I need to change it up. Like I need to stop using this tool because I'm just relying on it too much. It's becoming my crutch. But, um, you know, a lot of the time I use secret because secret's a great way to get yourself out of a hole. It's like, wait a minute, someone wasn't telling the truth. Truth. Okay, great. Let's throw that in the mix. How do we incorporate it? Can we incorporate it? Okay, we can. And then it becomes about the lack of information or false information creates a whole thing. If you look at things like some of all my favorite movies, Unusual Suspects, Fight Club, stuff like that, it's all about the truth <laughs> and the lie. <laughs> and people are like, well, it's so amazing. I'm like, yeah. Cause you don't know the whole story. <laughs> like that's the whole thing, right? Like it's a very basic thing at the end of the day, but it's complicated in application, but it's easy in application when you paint yourself into the corner, all of a sudden you put yourself in the corner and it becomes an outlet. Do you know that the sixth sense M night Shyamalan didn't come up with the actual thing that sold the movie until the sixth draft. He wrote five drafts of the movie, which theoretically probably sucked. Until he came up with apparently the sixth draft, which is the whole movie. And if you watch the movie and you get kind of caught into the narrative of it, five drafts didn't really work until the sixth one, because that's when he realized, oh, hey, wait a minute, here's the big thing. And that, you know, like, I mean, I don't know, like, apparently that's the story. I find that very fascinating because it means that he was writing a story based on a whole different thing until he was like, wait a minute, like what if it was like this? And that is the movie without that thing that he discovered. So, you know, I think with mastery and like, I think he built a whole career on that too. Like if you look at all of his other movies following um, that one movie, the sixth sense is really what launched his entire career. But the, the, a lot of the times, 
you know, I'm not trying to slam the guy by any means, but uh, but some fault that people had with M. Night Shyamalan movies was that they felt like, oh, his movies are all about the twist. It's always like, what's the twist Shyamalan's going to have, you know? And it mm-hmm. became this almost like, give me something other than your little thing. You know what I mean? Because what ended up happening was I think it starts to become this thing where it's like, you're just known for this, this kind of pony show that you do. You know what I mean? Yeah. Whereas like, and that's where technique becomes, okay. Like you can't just keep relying on that. Like you need, we need more to your work than, than that. But um, the, the point is, is that I think the master has patience with things and doesn't, you know, like lets things breathe a little bit, you know, whereas the, the, the person that's maybe new and doesn't have the maturity or wisdom, they try to force things. They try to make things happen. Whereas the master, by letting it breathe, by giving it some room, they, they let it show them the opportunity, you know? And Mm -hmm. I feel like an artist, part of your job is to push yourself into a place where you don't know what you'll do until you get there yeah. you know like that's part of your job like because like if you always know what you're going to do probably the audience knows what you're going to do because what knowing what you're going to do is usually the most obvious thing that there could be you need to get yourself to a place where you don't know what you're going to do and you're going to find out and then everyone's going to find out with you because you didn't know and you never telegraphed what got you there and so then all of a sudden you just do you know um i'll share one story evan if you don't mind i know you probably have something to say but i don't know if you remember this class we were in uh, nathaniel's class and i was working with emilio and we were doing uh oh the heck's that movie um training day we were doing a scene from training day and i had gone through a breakup recently and nathaniel was fucking pushing my buttons so hard and he's like this guy fucked your girlfriend and da 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 and he's like giving me all these things and like I was getting eaten up about this breakup and and um, Emilio puts a gun in my face and he's like threatening to like shoot me it, whatever that's how the scene went and I like put my mouth around the gun or something like I, I, I was like but in my mind I was like fucking do it like I was in so much pain. I was like, blow my fucking head off. And all he could do was pull the gun away in kind of a, you called my bluff. And I remember afterwards, Nathaniel was like, that was so good. He was like, what made you think to do that? But like, really, I didn't know I was going to do that. I had no intention of doing that. There was no plan of doing that. But it just, I, he he did the right things. He helped aggravate the situation for me enough so that I would make a kind of weird choice like that in the moment. If you looked at it from the onset, you say, oh, that's such a great choice. What a great idea. It wasn't a choice at all. It was like, I was literally at the point in that moment, this sounds crazy to people who aren't actors, but like where I was like, I'm in so much pain, fucking end it now. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? And it's like, and, and that, that's a weird, it's weird to say that. Like actors, we talk so weird because we, we, weirdly enjoy putting ourselves in these fucking bizarre situations Mm -hmm. but it's that's part of what people want to see we want to see that and that's what actors do they go to those places we hope we never do in life really yeah yeah hey everybody this is evan and this episode is brought to you by my book yes i recently released a book called the actor's awakening connecting spirituality to craft expand yourself as an actor and your craft through a spiritual perspective Take a journey that will explore universal philosophies and insights to help you understand human nature in a profound way and develop practices to take your work to another level. Again, that's The Actor's Awakening, Connecting Spirituality to Craft, available on Kindle and paperback on Amazon. And as always, if you like the show, please subscribe. (laughs) Yeah, and it is. It's funny. uh, You know, it's one of those things in the acting world here. It's like, oh, like the choices that you make and... You know, one of the uh, person I've mentioned more than one, on more than one occasion on this podcast, Jita Krishnamurti, he talks about a thing called uh, choiceless, choiceless awareness, which, you know, he is, he, he asserts 
that choice is actually confusion, which is an interesting thing to think about. And I think he does actually have a point on this, which is that in the moment you think that you have a choice, it means that you actually don't have clarity. But when you, Mm -hmm. when you are actually completely aware, there's just the action of what's being done. It's not a choice. And in that moment, you saying that, and I actually remember that class a little bit that that you, you mentioned, I was like, oh yeah, I was in that class. I, I, I kind of remember when that happened, taking me down memory lane. And in that moment, I think that's one of the things I love about acting is because, is because of the, the, you know, like live in front of you spontaneity that that happens and that's what we want as as an audience we we want that that sense of spontaneous this is kind of out of control that's what makes a a drama a play a, a show very exciting to exciting to witness but in that moment it wasn't a choice. You just did it because that was, that was the thing to happen, which I think is, is pretty wild. Like it doesn't sound like it was something that you, again, like, yeah, you chose to do that, but someone watching it retrospectively, if you, to examine it would say like, Oh, their choice to do this. And, and, that's a whole other conversation almost in the, in the confusion that exists between the doing and the analysis of something, which is a whole other problem within the art field. Like it's not a useless one, but it, it's, it introduces its own problems for what I think has, we've already communicated at this point, but yeah, just to touch on that and something that you said a little bit earlier as well, which is that like, yeah, we don't want to see the work that goes, that goes into it, you know, and that's like one of the things that the master is so, is so adept at, at doing is that you don't really, you you don't really see what went into it, what went on behind it. It's like it just appeared. And that's what we want again as, as audience members. And I, I don't think that's just as within the, world of acting but i think it's it exists in all of the artistic mediums as well like when you actually look you know and some people are really fascinated by this stuff but um and so i was listening to conan o'brien uh his podcast conan o'brien needs a friend and he recently had zach braff on there and they were talking about just like the filmmaking process, the movie making process. And, and Zach Braff was talking about how, you know, everyone thinks it's so, it's so exciting, you know, people who aren't involved in it. And he's like, and then, you know, you have a friend or a family member come by and they, and they spend the day on set and they're like, this is really boring. (laughs) You know, like there's a whole lot of just like, you know, the, the, what goes into it is, is, very different than the thing that you get as an audience member, you know, and, and you have to be, that's why the people who are typically in the, in the business and who do very well and do really terrific work, why they're, it's why they're passionate about it is because they, they, they love all of the things that go into the making of it. Because for so many people, it's like, it's like, my God, this is like watching paint dry. How many times are we going to watch this are we going to do this shot of these people just walking out this door? Right. And Conan made some comment. I don't remember what, what movie he was talking about now, but you know, he's like, Oh yeah. Like it's not just you're coming down to set and you're watching, you know, like Eddie Murphy and Nick Nolte, you know, shooting guns and making jokes, right? Like it's, it's, you're probably not going to see that in in what's going on because they're they're not doing the stunts, they're not doing all this crazy stuff. Like it's it's the 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 work that goes into it is very different. And even from my very limited experience of learning how to record music and recording music with some people, I was like, "Whoa, this is tedious work." Like 
it's really tedious work going and, and doing the take over and over and over again and then and then cutting it, editing it, editing it, getting it all lined up and right. Like it's, there's a lot that goes into it. And, and even for myself who was directly involved with it and, and, and recording, you know, my own stuff. So there was definitely an excitement to it, but there was a part of me that, that recognized, like, I don't know if this is something that I would ever actually be interested in, in pursuing just because I'm like, I don't know if I have that thing for this, but Mm -hmm. when it comes to the world of acting, yeah, like I've got, there's there, I, I have a deep, deep interest and, and what has become an intimacy with this particular thing. And, you know, maybe this is a good segue for this, but what's been interesting to me about having been in the acting world for as long as I have now and sometimes being surprised at how much I know about it to a certain certain extent where it's like and I I'm this isn't to say that I know everything about it at all but that I know how to navigate it I know when when a student asks me a certain question about it a question that maybe I've never answered before or no one has ever posed to me before. I can take it and within a very short period of time, I actually start to create, I I actually, an understanding begins to be formed out of that question based on this territory that I know, right? And, and, even though it's brand new, there's something where it's like, I already kind of know it in a weird sort of way. But very often that question just also helps me go deeper into what I'm doing. Right. And even though at this point in my life and career, I'm not acting so much, I'm mostly in teaching, but it's all part of this, this mastery of this thing even when I've gone and learned and and learned a little bit and done some screenwriting, you know, uh, and with, and, and teaching like all of these things that seem like they might be a little bit outside are all still part of this, this quest, at least for me, for what I might call mastery of this thing called acting. Well, I mean, you know, Marlon Brando, um, you know, he pointed out that I'm sure others have as well, but he pointed out that everybody's acting all the time mm-hmm. and, uh, you know, everybody's, everybody's playing a role, playing a part. And, you know, I think the thing about acting is that it's, it's interesting because it's like, why, why do you do it? And, and what, what about it is like, what do you, what are you trying to get? You know, what are you trying to explore? And I mean, everybody's trying to get something, right? I mean, I think this is the thing. It's like people can deny it and they can say, oh, you know, you're trying to get something, you know, and that's what acting really is. I mean, it's like presenting yourself and like, why do you comb your hair in the morning? (laughs) You know, why do you do it? Why, why do you, why do you, why do you dress the way you dress? That's all acting, man. All of that stuff is all a performance. It's all a presentation, you know? And Mm -hmm. so... I think the master begins to let go of the kind of, when you think about acting, just to use that as an example, they let go of the bullshit that they, that most are hiding. To me, the amateur is hiding the truth all the time. They're always like, yeah, you like, they have this ulterior motive that isn't, isn't authentic. And so they're, you know, they're acting about their acting. They, they deceive themselves. It's they believe their own bullshit. You know what I mean? It's like, um, you, you have access to great things. We all have access to great things. Some of us have a proficiency at certain mediums and maybe we should go explore those things because for whatever we, reason, we have an inclination to them. I think your, your example of music is a good example of this. 
you know, looking at the work it takes to produce a song versus the work it takes to do an acting performance. If, if you don't like the work that it takes to do the thing, then it's not for you because that's really what it is, you know? Yeah. And that should be like, obvious. <laughs> yeah. Like 95% of my writing is not actual screenwriting. I can write a script in a day. Writing the script is not hard. That's easy for me. It's the work that goes into writing the script that's hard. It's the it's the mulling over the characters. It's the working through the story events. It's the emotional exploration of what that means and where I want to go with it. Why the hell am I even doing this in the first place? And the and the doubts and the fears and all the other bullshit that comes up all around all that. For some reason, I like doing that shit, <laughs> which is why I have an inclination to write. Like, um, you know, and and so to me, you know, I've had to go through this this whole little journey of like, like, do I even care if anyone ever reads my writing? Because I write every day. Like, I write thousands of words every day. I mean, I write so much that most people, if they saw my writing, they'd be like, how, "This is amazing how much you write." But for me. I haven't cared to share the writing because that's not what it's been about for me. And as I go through this next stage in my evolution of, of that part of the art, I've actually fallen in love with the process of writing more than I even like the reward of writing. But I would say like early on in my years, it was more about like, I got to write to make a movie. I got to, it was always to do something. And granted, I do think there's a problem with, you know, keeping it all to yourself. I think there's a certain point where it's good to share. But for me, my relationship to sharing has been a mature maturity, you know, and a, and a wisdom that's come out of that. And like what I've been trying to work on for the last, I'd say like five years, it sounds like probably a lot of time to a lot of people. And even when I say it aloud, it sounds like a lot of time to me, but like what I've been trying to work on is finding my voice. Because if I'm going to write and if I'm going to start sharing these stories that I've been developing, I'm not doing it for the same reasons that I was doing it before. Because when I started writing, one of the reasons I started screenwriting was not because I wanted to tell a great story necessarily, partly maybe, but it was more because I wanted to make movies. And I was like, okay, but I want to make movies. So I need to write to make movies. And if I want to, you know, take control of my acting career, then I need to write parts for myself. And, and that's why I did it. But even though that motivated to get me started, that like was a very immature way of of doing that very important medium of art and it wasn't until i would say like in my early 30s where all of a sudden i realized i had stories that i wanted to tell it's much different sounds similar but it's much different i didn't just want to make a movie i wanted it to tell a story and then when I started exercising, actually telling a story, I realized what can happen when I actually tell a story and why telling a story is very important and it matters. And that was like an awakening. And then it sent me on this journey of, you know what, maybe you're not like, like, can you, can you actually, do you have the technique, do you have the capacity to even tell the stories that you want to tell? And then it was like, okay, well, let's go explore that. So the first half of my writing career was just about, I got to learn how to write so I can make a movie. The second half has been about, I need to learn how to write so I can actually tell a story that I want to tell. Because mm -hmm. now I'm trying to figure out how to actually communicate these experiences inside of myself in a way in which others can experience them. It's a very different thing. It's a much more mature and evolved version of storytelling, but it took years yeah for me to figure that out <laughs> and and one thing that was interesting about what you said in there that I want to touch on is you know you you characterized it before as like well it was it was it was immature and I think that for most of us when we hear that we go it's like oh so it was it, it was it was bad or it wasn't good or it was and I don't even think that that's that's the way of even looking at that because it's not it's not a it's not a bad or a wrong thing it's it's just part of the it's a process it's a it's it's an inevitable yes. unavoidable process is is 
you always it's always a movement from immaturity to maturity yes and anything that's that's being that you're doing for the first time is going to be immature but know that the immaturity is actually what's got you in the game <laughs> yeah totally exactly. in a way right it's like it's that's that such a great point yeah yeah like the, it's the that immature thing still got you into the door right it's got you to go into this thing and and it's just going to, and there is going to be that process. It's, it's only natural that a maturing process is going to happen, but the immaturity isn't a wrong thing was really the, the thing that I, I just wanted to point out and draw some attention to. It's not, it, so it's to avoid a judgment around the whole, around the whole thing, because again, there's, there's a value to it. There's a value to that, that not knowing aspect of it, because sometimes we have experiences where we're like, if I had known that this is what it was going to be, I might've never done this. Yeah. Right. If I knew that this was going to be experienced, I might've never gone into it. And, and even if whatever that thing is that we, we got into, if it's something that we decide that, that we're like, no, this isn't for me. I'm not going to continue to go on this any further. It usually still, it, it still served a purpose it still provided something of value to whatever the thing is that you're actually doing, whatever it is that you're actually about in your life. It still, it still gave you something, right? Some, some pieces to, to, yeah, the essence of, of who you really are and what it is that you're really trying to do. Typically, if you're looking and if you're paying attention, that's usually there. Mm hmm. Yeah. And I think that's an important point you bring up because for the people who are in a stage of say, let's just say quote unquote immaturity with whatever they're doing. Yeah. Don't make that wrong. I mean, that's just, that's just part of the, that's part of the process, part of the journey. And I think that, you know, I think we, we, well, okay, well maybe I'll wait until I'm more mature with this. Don't, you know, I say, just start, just begin. Like, you know, like it, enjoy the novelty of it. Enjoy the newness of it all and the fun of it, you know? Um, actually, Evan, I've been re-watching the show Entourage. <laughs> and classic. I just... Uh, classic. By the way, from a... Just an... Obs, ob, like, observing with whatever you think about the show, brilliantly done from a narrative point of view. So well done because it makes you care about things, brings you on a journey, spins it around flips and flops itself so that you're like, Oh no, oh, this didn't work out. Oh, I hope this works out and gets involved with the characters, leaves you on cliffhangers, does everything right from that perspective. So regardless of the content of it from a structurally sound point of, you know, putting a story together, brilliant, but rewatching it, I'm like, man, I can relate to so much of this. Like in my early years, twenties, like starting out and just, um, you know, there's these, uh, I mean, man, like, I mean, I wasn't famous like that, but I was in, I mean, I was hanging out with famous people. I was involved in a lot of that stuff and the whole experience of, you know, just, you know, just fun and, and how the movie industry was and all of that stuff. It was, it's all very like they, they hit on something that's very real for a lot of us, whether we're in the industry or outside of the industry, it hit on something very, I think very relevant and true just for like everybody and it's a repeating story that's what makes it kind of timeless um and this whole idea of you know like i don't know like if you look at it like um what is his name chase something chase uh vinny vinny chase vinny chase that's right vinny chase yeah. but like his um his evolution as an actor it starts out, he's just a good looking guy that kind of got a break and he had a bit, he had charisma and he starts getting success almost despite himself. And I really mean that despite himself, but as the show evolves, he, it becomes like, is he actually even a good actor? And, you know, and like, what's that mean now? And his career nearly ends during the show, right? He nearly like, it, it nearly becomes this kind of like, he's this hit for a little bit and then it's just disappear and um he rebuilds and kind of comes back and whatever and you know the the 
the thing I think of what's interesting about that narrative and that arc is like, that's so much of what it's kind of like as an actor, because you're this young person. If you get any success early on, you don't even know why you got it half the time. And it might just be because your looks and you might even be somewhat aware of that, but it's like, then it becomes about like, okay, like now I actually have to get my chops. Now I actually have to figure this shit out. And like, mm-hmm. when it comes to the game of like, you know, fame and money, like this level, like, you know, um, all these people have built their careers around this guy, you know, their lives around this guy. Cause you yeah. know, and he doesn't even know why he's, but, but it's so fly by the seat of your pants in that respect. And I think that's, what's interesting about this conversation, because I feel like the maturity to mastery is in those early stages. It's immature and it is fly by the seat of your pants and it is just go for it and try it. And if something's working, run with it, even if you don't understand it, but at the same time, you know, you can kind of keep a a pulse on it. It's like, okay, like I got to learn some shit. I got to figure this stuff out, you know, like, Mm -hmm. and, and not just like, um, you know, and I think that's where the, the longevity of something really comes in is where like, you know, um, you begin to evolve as you age and as you grow with it and as you experience with it. You know, because there's so many stories of, say, movie stars that they were blips, right? They were famous for a little bit. They did some work for a little bit and then disappeared. But those people that hung in and have been around for 10, 20, 30 more years, I mean, the, there is evolution, you know? That's not mm-hmm. just a, that isn't just a, a, a person who is just, good looking good looking might have got them in right and uh, i mean i think that's a reality of acting to some degree but like not always but i'm just saying you know from traditionally and um maybe that got them in but after that like they had to figure out how to actually you know how to how to maintain how to how to explore mm-hmm. you know i think acting's evolved now where we're not so limited in you know people can be um more i'd say um, and I don't mean this as a dig at anybody, but we can be more average looking and actually have quite successful careers now. But there was a time where it was all about, you know, it was all, it was, it, there was less content. It was all about kind of the, the, the pretty people. And that really was a big part of what made the film industry flourish or the weird. And then it became kind of a weird or oddball person. If you were weird or odd, or you were really beautiful, those are the people that were flourishing. But now we have this totally different open-ended spectrum of, of what gets us in. But if you get in, if you get a break, you know, let's call it, then it becomes about evolution because, you know, your 15 minutes of fame will only be 15 minutes if you don't evolve past that 15 minutes, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, But I feel like that's with everything, man. It's like, you know, you, you got to, you got to evolve. You got to mature with it. You have to, you know, because it gets old, man. You know, just <laughs> looking a certain way or having a certain sense of humor, it gets old. You need to be able to evolve and adapt. Like, otherwise it'll, you know, people get tired of it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. One of the things that, with what you're saying, makes me think is, you know, a big part of mastery, which I think is is almost on a broader level, not just like within a specific area, but mastery in terms of in terms of i suppose just life perhaps is learning is bringing a maturity to your immaturity bringing a maturity to the places where you are immature Mm -hmm. i think that there's that that's that's one of those little things that can that can actually be a, uh, an, almost an accelerator to that evolution and and to growth as opposed to, you know, a more being immature to your immaturity, <laughs> I suppose, where you're coming in with a lot of ignorance, perhaps a lot of arrogance, stubbornness, you know, all, all uh, a lot of ego perhaps and part of just being a mature human being is learning to just come in with humility and 
and which is a maturity, I think. Humility, I think, in, in, which is an interesting thing to think about is, is the relationship between those. But I think humility is a kind of maturity. And when you bring that to into your life and with with awareness and and mindfulness the areas where you where you know you're immature you actually i think step out of that immaturity phase much more quickly Mm -hmm. i i think that with um when we're talking about this it's like your humility is not meekness in the sense that you you know you you don't it's not about um because I think humility sometimes gets interpreted the wrong way. I I mm-hmm. think that you can be humble and confident. It doesn't mean one or the other. Arrogance, though, is arrogance is like banking on a lie, right? It's banking on a, uh, and and I also think arrogance is a self deception, whereas humility is like recognizing that you're you're human and flawed and imperfect, and that you have weaknesses and everybody has weaknesses, but hu- humility is not necessarily like saying I'm less than it's saying I'm human. I am human. I am flawed, imperfect, figuring it out, working it out, doing it. Um, but you can still have confidence from that place. Whereas arrogance is like pretending you have it all figured out, pretending you're better, pretending you have some special thing. And like, if you, like if it's sometimes it's sometimes just hard work like if you have done a lot of hard work um a lot of the time knowing that you've done the work can give you a certain amount of confidence but there's also the um the confidence you can have is like that you chose to believe that it was possible when others didn't and trusting in that vision or that belief you have when others don't. Because I think one of the big things about being mature in in any medium, have it be art or even something else, is that it takes a very courageous person to believe when you're in a world that's constantly talking you out of your dreams and constantly talking you out of stuff. So, you know, you can be humble and say, yeah, like this... I don't exactly know what I'm doing. This is challenging. I recognize that, but like, I'm going to go out and do it anyway. And I'm going to give it a shot, you know, and give yourself a little bit of credit for that. Cause that takes, that actually takes courage and bravery to, 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 to bet on yourself and like to bet on humanity, man. Like as you get older, you know, you get burned, you get betrayed, you, you know, things happen to you and to decide, Hey man, I'm not going to be a bitter person for lack of a better term, piece of shit. I'm going to trust people again. I'm going to try to build relationships. I'm going to try to figure this stuff out, you know, but so many people choose the road of the victim, right? They go, Oh, people are bad. People are this like, look, I know people are selfish. I get it. People are self-involved. They want to serve themselves. They like their comforts. I totally understand all that stuff that could easily make me jaded, but I decide, you know what, that there are people that there are people out there and I don't need everybody, but there are people out there who, who want to extend their circle, who want to be good, who want to, who, who want a world like I want. And I'm not going to, I'm not going to let victimhood make me small and, and, and little and meek, you know? And I think part of maturity, you know, this is something we haven't really talked about. Maybe it's something to finish off on. Part of maturity is having that childlike innocence in spite of in spite of the hardships that you're going to go through on your journey. So, you know, that's one last thing I think is worth kind of mentioning as we're wrapping this up is like, you know, it's um, you can easily become less as you get older and more experienced by letting things wear you down, you know, and part of the maturity and wisdom and mastery is about not letting your experiences wear you down but try to let them build you up. Yeah. You, yeah. You're muted. Yeah. The, you know, I, th- I, I, another thing I've said on here many times, uh, Dan Millman life 
is not so much shaped by our experiences as they are by our expectations. Mm. Right. And I mean, and there's, it's not, that there isn't a connection between those. Our, our experiences often the thing are often the thing that we end up shaping our expectations around, but those things are often very misleading <laughs> or misguided. So yeah, I guess that's me just saying, uh, yeah, I, I, I agree with you. Well, <laughs> yeah. So anyway, I mean, I think I'll, I'll just say this last thing before I wrap up your past. And this is, this is a challenge. I think as you get more experience, your past does not have to be your future, but if you keep putting your past in front of you, you will continue to relive your past. So, mm-hmm. you know, the one thing about the new person, the one thing about the, you know, the immature person coming into the industry is they usually don't have a past they're putting in front of it, which is why it's so helpful. And that's why mm-hmm. beginner's mind, I think is so valuable. Whereas the, you know, the, the old soul, the person that's been in it for a while, however you want to, whatever you want to call them, part of their downfall can be the fact that they keep bringing their past experiences in front of them. And you got to let that shit go. And in a way, you know, we have to begin again and again and again. And that's not, it's easier said than done, granted, Mm. but I do think it's a part of what we need to do in our maturity to mastery. Yeah. Because if you mature, it doesn't mean you'll reach mastery. Part of mastery is becoming new again and new again and new again, but now this time with wisdom and experience which is easier said than done. It's my yeah. point. So No, I agree. Um, oh, I love that. Yeah. Okay. I have a beer. I know you don't. So we'll skip your, I don't have a beer. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have this delicious beer from, uh, I've gone with Red Collar Brewing Co. again. And any any beer with a dog on the front is always like, always, <laughs> I always like that. Love animals, love dogs, love cats, saw them. But, um, uh, this one's an IPA. It's, uh, is there a name? It's the Red Collar Brewing Co. IPA. Uh, yeah, I don't know the name. Um, anyway, delicious. Uh, delicious beer. I, I really liked it. So that's what I'm having. Um, all right, well, let's wrap it up, man. What, what are your final thoughts? Oh, man. Final thoughts on this one. Well, yeah, no, it was a, it was a, it was an enjoyable just exploration of of you know just this idea of mastery which is in and of itself a a pretty big a pretty big topic like what what even is that what does that look like and and that that whole idea of of again that the master isn't someone who's just perfect which i think is a is a misconception the master is is just experienced and adaptable you know and and has let go of has let go of necessarily i guess the techniques and the tools as being the as being their the thing that they're, that they're hanging on to, you know, I think that the master isn't hanging on to anything, you know, they've, they've, as we said, like the, I think the word intimate is a very, a very big word in this whole thing. And the master isn't trying to force or will anything. And I think that that's one of the, the, the stages of immaturity that, that exists is that there's there's this exertion this force of will to make something happen as opposed to the master who understands themselves in relationship to something in relationship to the thing that they are doing and are looking to it to inform them of what to do so in terms of trying to wrap all that up into something, I don't know if I can do that at this particular moment, but I think that the, the master is, is 
very often not what we think what we think of the master being so yeah and and that again as far as this title is as this title is concerned yeah it's it's a maturing process i think that's the the other thing that was that was interesting to me is towards the end here that that yeah it's this constant process of immaturity into maturity with things and that not making making that process any part of that process wrong or not good enough or Mm -hmm. you know like there's no there's no judgment on it it's just is what it is and there's no there's no sidestepping that the only uh, your best mastery that you can have in that situation is to is to bring the maturity that you have to the immature process (laughs) i guess Mm. so yeah yeah that's that's where i'll leave it yeah, well, I like I liked your take on it. I really like the thing that I I really like that you put into this conversation was that immaturity isn't bad. It isn't a bad part of the process. It's a necessary part of the process, and we be we ought to embrace it and just accept it as a part of the whole thing. Like it's it's okay that you might be somewhat immature in your in your journey at this point, and that it might be somewhat new and novel and fun and that's okay. I mean, that's, that's a fine part of your journey to process through. Right. Like, and, and I think that, uh, as you, as you engage with whatever medium you're engaging with, you know, open yourself up to, you know, open yourself up to evolving your process and, and, and try to be honest with yourself. I think that's ultimately like what I would say is like, like, what do I even do with this conversation? You know, you've listened to us banter and talk about all this. I would say like, uh, say be okay with where you're at, but be honest with where you're at. And as you become aware and you find new insights, um, you know, don't pretend, don't fake, like call yourself out on it. And that, you know, that, I think at the end of the day, honesty is your best friend and it's not always going to feel good, but that's where the mature and the wise master really comes into fruition is that they, I think the master sees themselves as a beginner again and again and again, but then has faith in their, in their work and their experience and wisdom and and they trust in that as well. And so these things, they're they're an evolving relationship. So let it evolve and evolve with it. And don't ever try to keep it somewhere. So if it worked for a little while and it seemed just right, just know that that was a time and place and that will change and evolve. And as you move to the next stage, it will be something else, but you need to adapt and move to the new place it's in. It it's one of those things where you'll never pin it down because it's never going to be the same, but, but you, if you evolve with it, it will feel natural and right wherever you are. Thank you for listening in on our conversation today. We hope you found something helpful that you can carry forward with you. Head over to our website, wayoftheartist.com for more free exclusive material and learn about the show. If you haven't already, please support us by subscribing to the show, sharing it with people you know, and keeping compassionate, creative conversation going.